I'd like to invite our guest speaker, Pastor Matt Boda, to come on up. And uh, for those who, who've never met Matt before, uh, Matt, you are beloved by us here at Westlife in so many ways. Um, <clears throat> and we're also a little proud of you because you did raise five daughters. And that alone gets you, I think, a gold star in your chart in heaven for that one. <laughs> so, uh, hey, Matt, um, you're the lead pastor just across the river from us, although we got to go through construction and a bridge to get to you, yeah. uh, at Rock Point Church. And uh, we're so thankful that we're, we're part of, uh, part of a, a family of churches in the Christian Missionary Alliance that we get to have these kind of moments together. Can I pray for you and then just let you loose? Because I know God has got a message on your heart uh, that I think all of us are just excited to hear about. So let me pray for you. Uh, Father, I thank you uh, for your church. I thank you for uh, people uh, who, who serve, whether in volunteer capacities or, or in leadership ways, and especially for Pastor Matt. Uh, God, would you just open our hearts to receive from your word uh, some great truth this morning? Uh, but God, beyond just hearing it, and this is a scary prayer even to come out of my own lips, would you help us to live it? Would you help us to live the truth that we're going to hear this morning? Uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go for it. Thank you, Ryan. It's a real privilege to be here today and to represent Rock Point and on behalf of our elders and our staff and to all of you and you. We just uh, give you a warm greeting from us. We're kingdom people, belong to the same kingdom, serve the same God. A number of your staff are good friends of mine. And I bless you. And I'm really honored to be able to be here today and to dive in. So I'm going to begin this morning with a dose of reality from my life. Today is the 22,155th day of my life. I'm in my 61st year of existence, and I've therefore lived just over 530,000 hours and over 32 million minutes. If I live to the average expectancy of a Canadian male, which is about 81 point something, I have 21.29 years of life left. And you know what else? I, I want to live twice that long. Here's what else I want to do. I want to keep following Christ with as much of my heart as Christ gives to me to be able to serve him for the rest of my life. I want to faithfully love Jamie, my best friend and my spouse of the past 36 years. I want to be a caring, fun-loving, and Christ-like dad to our five girls, our four son-in-laws, and our nine grandchildren until I go to heaven. Uh, I want to keep serving alongside of a great team of people like I serve with at Rock Point Church. I want to be a person who keeps developing my spiritual gifts and use them to serve Christ's church. I want to stay in shape. I want to pay off our mortgage. I want to save enough to survive retirement, and I want to enjoy vacations with our family in interesting places. You know what else I want to do? I don't want to die friendless. I don't want to die friendless because so much of life God is wrapped up in the idea of relationship. Friendless people miss out on so much in life. Friendless people have a hard time becoming what God wants them to become. Friendless people are a hollow shell of what God intended them to be. So that's why I'm here today, and that's what my talk is all about today. Um, my topic today is restoring relationships in a broken world so that we don't die friendless. And we all know that we live in a world that is relationally broken. We're on the eve of a federal election that, as our elections tend to be, is, is quite broken and diverse. <laughs> We're wallowing in opinions about COVID and opinions about our lives and how they should be lived. We belong to churches, you to Westlife, me to Rock Point, where we have a wide variety and spectrum of div divergent opinions about everything from mass to government to gathering to whether to obey the government, to the church's relationship, to vaccinations. If there was ever a time when we need to focus on not dying friendless, it's today. I've been told that there are Christ followers who are in desperate need to hear God's heart for restoration of families, of marriages, of friendships, of boards, of neighbors, of co-workers. How in the world do we become agents of reconciliation in a world that is so polarized. So here's my big idea. If you only take something home, or if you're sitting at home, keep this with you. Here's my big idea today. As go our relationships, so goes our service of Jesus. As go our relationships, so go our service of Jesus. So I want to talk about four premises that reinforce that big idea. And I want to begin by talking about this premise. As human beings... We are created for community. Allow me to illustrate. When the American West was first settled, I picture the land out west of us here in Springbank. Farmers from the east moved onto the western plains 
and they began to, to homestead. And they were all given a quarter by the government, a quarter section of land. And most of them went onto their land and they, they, they coming from all of the, the crowded row homes and streets in Baltimore and Washington and Philadelphia and New York and Boston, they came out to the prairies and they put their, they put their farm, they built their barn, they built their house right smack dab in the middle of their land. And then, of course, the guy and gal and the next farm did, and the next farm, and the next farm did. But they found in American history that over time, people began to move to the corners of their property, and they would rebuild, or they would move their farm, their farm buildings. You know why? It was a thirst and a hunger for community, because we're made for community. And those places, those became known as four corners. We were, lived near one in Salem, Oregon when we lived there. Four corners where a family, a family, a family, a family had moved in search of community. Another illustration, almost 50 years after World War II took place, a survey was conducted in England of the residents of the city of London, and they were asked to choose their favorite time of life. And an amazing discovery was made by this particular newspaper that did this poll when they discovered that the majority of those who were around during World War II chose the Blitz as their all-time favorite time of their lives. Do you know what the Blitz was? The Blitz was a nine-month period of time which began in September 1940 when the German Air Force launched an all-out assault on the city of London. And for months, every night, those London families would go down into the subway, down into the metro, and they would bring their blankets and bring their pillows, and their whole family would come, and they would bring food, and people would sit there, and they would talk until they fell asleep. That's their favorite period of life. I've read that Billy Graham, when he began his ministry, brought around him people who were friends in ministry, and as they grew together, they decided that they were all going to build homes in the same area and grow old together doing ministry. All these stories are true because human beings are made in the image of God, and because we're made in the image of God, we're created for community. And we long, and we thirst for it. In his book on the Trinity, Daryl Johnson writes, at the center of the universe is a relationship. This is the most fundamental truth I know. At the center of the universe is a community, and it's out of that relationship that you and I were created and redeemed. It's for that relationship that you and I were created and redeemed. Made in the image of God, we were made for relationship, and thus the chief aim of life is not to enjoy the good gifts God's given us. It's not to obey the rules that he's laid down for us, but to know him and be known by him, to know others and to be known by them. Our loving relationships between human beings and God and each other is the way things are supposed to be. Have you ever wondered why? You turn to the scriptures and you discover that we're told that we're to love the Lord our God with our everything and love our neighbor as ourselves. Have you ever wondered why the Ten Commandments are so relational in nature? Have you ever wondered why the, the, the uh, letters of Paul are filled to the brim with a whole ton of one another's? You can run through the alphabet almost, accept one another, be kind to one another, compassionate to one another, devoted to one another, encourage one another, forgive one another. It just goes on and on. Have you ever wondered why Jesus said that if you refuse to forgive someone for something they've done to us? that he will refuse, his heavenly father will for, for, refuse to forgive us? Or why in the Sermon on the Mount Jesus told us that if we find ourselves worshiping and we suddenly realize that someone has something against us, we're to drop our gift and we're to go and we're to be reconciled to that person? The scriptures are filled with these. And no matter what generation marks you, have you ever wondered why the most popular television shows in history have all revolved about, around a week-by-week week re, re, uh, revelation of the celebration of a community? You go back, cheers, life within a Boston bar community, Cliff and Norm, Sam and Woody and Diane. Seinfeld. The lives of a bunch of 30-something Jews living in New York. Jerry, George, Elaine, and Kramer. Friends. Life within a community of New York City. Six of them. 20-somethings. Monica, Rachel, Phoebe, Ross, Chandler, and Joey Tribbiani. How you doing? And then lastly, the Big Bang Theory. Life within a community of late 20-somethings that live in Pasadena, California. Sheldon and Penny, Howard and Leonard and Raj. The reason, as human beings, we're made for community. We're hunger for it because we're made for it. But that's not all. A second premise that reinforces my big idea that as go our relationship, so goes our service, is this. At heart, the gospel is relational. 
Now, I'm, I'm going to read to you a passage of Scripture. Over the last uh, three or four weeks, I've been kind of basting my life in it, and I've just come to realize what a special portion of Scripture it is, and I didn't, I've, heard, I've just missed this. There are commentators that say that this is the most important passage in all of Ephesians. So I'm going to read it, and you can hear some of my emphasis in my voice as I read. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 11. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. But now, you've been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him by the blood of Jesus. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Sorry, I lost my place here. I got so going here. He did this by ending the system of law with all of its commands and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together in one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility toward one another was put to death. Man, it it goes on and on, but you can just hear those words. All those words are about relationships. All of those words teach us that when Christ came and he came to the cross, it's amazing what he did for us. Hear some of those phrases one more time. We are people who are now carefully joined in him. It says, now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You're citizens along with God's holy people. You're members of God's household. And together we are his house, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. Now, somebody has explained what's going on in this passage by using a diagram. At our church, we call it the up-in-out diagram. We don't have anything more that we can do in that. But basically, this is a picture to you and me of the relational realignment that takes place when we are saved When salvation comes to our lives and we become followers of Jesus, we become people who have a renewed relationships upwards as disciples living under the reign of Christ in our lives. We're people whose lives change because our in is different. Inside the body of Christ, in relationship to other people who are followers of Jesus, our relationships change to one of serving one another and caring for one another. And then our relationship out is important that outside of this church family and this household, we become influential in other relationships. We are made for worship. We are made for connection. We are made for influence. And that's important for us to remember that God came, sent his son, and changed our lives forever on the cross, breaking down any wall or partition that exists between us and anyone else in this world. Most of us who are listening right now are Gentiles. And in the world of Paul, there were really two classifications. There were the Jews who were considered God's people, and there were the Gentiles who were considered not. And it says Christ on the cross died in such a way as to bring us together as Jews and Gentiles into one family. The Son came to do something special. Listen to these words from Romans 8, 29. We read, God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. The son stands first in the line of humanity he restored, and we see the original and intended shape of our lives there in him. In other words, what the son came to do provided a prototype for us as to what we can and how we should live and the priorities we would pursue in our lives. To put it more plainly, God's plan and strategy in sending his son was to show us how we are to live, the shape of our lives. 
There is no doubt from Scripture that the dominant emphasis at the center of our lives is a series of relationships that are marked by integrity, by shalom, by peace, and by wellness. The kinds of relationships in which people move from outsiders to insiders, from being excluded to being included, from citizenship that's not granted to citizenship that is granted, to walls being broken down, from different groups of people to one people. Hostility is put to death as reconciliation happens. Let's remember that. Let's not forget that. It's important to know that at the heart of the gospel is relationships. Thirdly, a third premise leads quite naturally into this. The building blocks of Christ's community are relational. The building blocks of Christ's community are relational. So you're watching right now from somewhere, or the, some of you are in the room. I walked into Westlife this morning and thought, man, this is some kind of a building. This, you have a great facility here, but this isn't the church. I'm not at the church. I'm with the church. I'm speaking to the church. But we are in a place of being reminded that the building blocks of the church are not bricks and mortar. They're people. We read in Acts chapter 2 of this amazing picture of what took, takes place. Acts 2 describes in detail the shape the first church in Jerusalem took after the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit filled people for the first time on a permanent basis. And we read, read these words. They may sound familiar to you. Let's le- read them again with fresh eyes. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Peter preaches and it says, Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day with about 3,000 in all. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over all of them. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in the homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. You catch this? I want you to catch what's going on here. Let me, let me highlight a couple of things. First, let me highlight this. All authentic community in this chapter has vertical roots. The roots of this new community of believers finds its beginning vertically in relationship to Christ. Everything that happens in verses 42 through 47 happens on the basis of what takes place in verse 41 as God, by His Spirit, extends salvation through Christ to 3,000 people. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to that church that day, about 3,000 in all. On this day, Less than three, two months after Jesus' death and resurrection, the first Christian community springs into action when 3,000 people responded to the message. That community had vertical roots. And then secondly, I want you to catch, actually, I want you to remember this. Dallas Willard says this. God's aim in human history is the creation of an inclusive community of loving persons with himself included as its primary sustainer and most glorious inhabitant. That is a mind-boggling statement. You ever sat in church? Ever sat with other people? Ever sat even serving Jesus? And wonder to yourself, what in the world is this all about? Sat in your small group, had your quiet time, spending time with God, but thinking to yourself, what is this thing all about? Here's, here, here's the answer. God's aim in human history is the creation of an inclusive community of loving persons with himself included as his primary sustainer and most glorious inhabitant. And secondly, remember that the wonder of this new community in Jerusalem is the ways in which their lives imprint one another horizontally. It's the this, if you can picture that. Now, I'm going to take a bit of a right turn. It's going to be a bit of a detour. As mentioned earlier by Ryan, Jamie and I raised five girls. We uh, had them early. We had them often. They're close together. They are only like six years and ten months from bottom to top or top to bottom. 
loved raising these girls, and their lives were very, very, very busy. But when our girls were young, their favorite TV show was uncontested. Little House on the Prairie. I have seen pretty much every episode of that series. And it recounted the adventures of a family living on a farm in a place called Plum Creek, which was near Walnut Creek in Minnesota. And it was, the show is really a, a, a show about a family called The Angles. It's the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. The lead character is a guy named Paul. You might remember Michael Landon. Ma, Caroline is called Ma. And then they had these four daughters named Mary and Laura and Carrie and Grace. And finally they had a son. Finally they had a son named Albert. Okay? They homesteaded. There's a general store in town that's owned by the, anybody know? Olson family. Nels Olson, whose wife was, he shouldn't have married her, uh, his daughter Nellie was probably the most precocious kid in human history, okay? Remember this. Now, here's, here's my point. Here's my point. I want you to imagine... Let's even do this. Come here, Ryan, come here. Tim, come here. I need you guys. You need to come stand right here. Whatever the camera takes, get, make sure you're in the camera when you look back. I'll use an illustration, okay? I want you to remember, so you're going to be Pa. You're going to be Nels Olsen. You're the grumpy old Norwegian. Okay, you're the good guy, okay? Think about all of the strands of relationship that exist between these two guys in that show. Okay? There's a strand of relationship that says they both live in Plum Creek. There's another one that says that they attend the same church. There's another one that says that their kids go to the same school. There's another one that says that you sell all your stuff to Pa for the farm. There's another one that says you actually keep a list there of things that you bought, and every once in a while you have to come in and shorten the account by paying your bills that's there. Same community, all this stuff. That go, when, when you open a restaurant, Nels, your first employee is Caroline, your wife. That's another one. Okay, just look. Strand. Strand. It's it's school, it's church, it's neighborhood, it's all this stuff that just goes back and back and back. Thank you very much, guys. Now, here's the trick. Come with me. Go ahead, go ahead. You come to my neighborhood, and I live in Emberside Glen, in Fireside, out in Cochrane, and the vast majority of the homes that live in my neighborhood, I have one strand of relationship with them. I live in Fireside. Okay? Sociologists call that simplex relationships— they call that multiplex or complex relationships. You know the fastest way to build community? Do exactly what they did in Acts chapter 2. You go back to these verses, start doing the things that they're doing. Sit under the same teaching, devote yourself to fellowship, share your meals, pray together, sh share your stuff with each other, sold, sell your property possessions and share with other people in need, worship at the temple each day, meet in your homes for the Lord's Supper, share your meals with great joy and generosity. All this stuff that builds community because it's strand, 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 strand. Those are the building blocks of the body of Christ. And when those happen, community happens in spades to fulfill the purpose of God in our lives. Now, let me stop and think about this for just a minute. One strand, they ate together. One strand, they shared with each other. One strand, they worshiped together. Stop and think about the rarity of those practices in our lives today. Now, I obviously know that there's a thing going on called COVID. But in our normal lives, how much do we prioritize eating meals together in each other's homes? How much do we prioritize worshiping together in each other's homes? How much do we prioritize sharing with each other in needs and skipping the garage sales because we take the things we have that have been provided for us by others to share with other people? You see, there are a variety of other strands that can be seen in the relationships these folks develop, but the perfect summary is found in this, verse 44 of Acts 2. All the believers were together and had everything in common, a group of people considered as a whole. That is powerful. What if we lived in such a way that we reflected that? A story. A number of years ago, Jamie and I had the privilege of going to work with one of our international teams that uh, lives in the Balkans, Europe. And we, uh, because of flights being delayed and stuff, we arrived at this particular hotel and place where we were meeting for a field forum with workers coming from all over the place. Like, I got there like 10 minutes before I had to speak at the first session. And there was a gentleman, gentleman up there by the name of Atse. 
He was Macedonian. And he led a band in worship, and he led very, very well. And when he was done, he prayed. He prayed for me by name, and I came up and I spoke. And when I was done, Atze came up to me. And he looked at me with a smile on his face, and he said this, I like your shirt. I said, well, thank you. It's the first time I've ever worn it. It was a soccer jersey. Our soccer club in Salem, Oregon was moving from Nike to Adidas, and they'd given me some of their swag, and I wore one of them, and it happened to be a Manchester United soccer jersey. And he really liked it. It was one of those thick ones. He just loved it. So he looks at me, and Otse says to me, we're here for the week together. Smile on his face. But by the time we leave on Friday, you will either have given me that shirt, I will have bought that shirt off of you, or I will have stole that shirt from you. <laughs> I'd had that shirt on for like an hour at that point, okay? It was a fresh shirt. So I said, oh, I'd say, come with me. We went back to my room, to my suitcase where I'd taken it out, got another shirt changed, handed him the shirt. He wore it every single session. And he said it this way. He said, you need to understand this. In my life, there are three Fs. My faith, my family, and football. And I am a, Macedo I am a U U Manchester United fan. Now, just, just think, I, I thought it was fantastic. I'm not tied to Manchester United or that particular shirt. I could totally give it away. But what if we live that way in life with everything? What if that marked our relationships, that kind of generosity, that kind of attentiveness to each other, that kind of care for others, that kind of openness to the Lord bringing distinct possibilities to us? This new community of people who are doing life together, prove it. The building blocks of the body of Christ are relationships. <clears throat> Let me give you one last premise. Think for a minute about this. Have you ever thought about the relationship that exists between what God is doing in the world, his mission, and how we live our lives. Okay, God's mission, what he's doing out there, big, big picture, umbrella, huge, and my life. You may think of it as, mm, mm, and mm, mm. You ever thought about the connection between those two? In truth, it is sobering to realize that relationships are absolutely integral to how God functions in the world. The, we call it the missio dei in Latin. God's mission in the world to reach people. To be more specific, God's mission is very much tied to how we live in relationship with one another. God created us to be in relationship with him. He also created us to be in relationship with one another, vertically and hor horizontally. You remember the whole love God, love others thing with the Ten Commandments. Jesus spoke about it in Matthew 22, 36 to 40. And he outlined for us, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's the first four Ten Commands. Love your neighbors yourself. That's the last six of the commands. I love this stuff. In his book, Andy Crouch has a book called Culture Making. He wrote this. God created a world designed for the flourishing of exquisitely relational creatures, male and female, who themselves are very good because they bear the image of a relational God. I know it's on the screen. Let's look at it again. God created a world designed for the flourishing of exquisitely relational creatures, male and female, who themselves are very good because they bear the stamp, the image of a relational God. We're made in his image. Can't camp there for just a minute and think about that, how powerful that is. And then listen to the call of the New Testament in reminding us that how we live every day, how we live in relationship to one another and others, plays such a significant role in what God is doing in the world. Let these scriptures bathe over you, servants of the church. Colossians 4, 5 to 6. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer anyone. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And then here's the big one. 1 Peter 2, 9 to 12. Verses worth memorizing. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession 
that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Your life, his mission deeply connected. How we live our lives matter. We're made in the image of God, but we're uniquely made, and that's not an accident. It's part of God's plan. We live in a culture that stresses the importance of independence, and yet so often the Bible teaches us to link arms and to walk together in interdependence as we fulfill the mission of God. To the church in Rome, Paul wrote, just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members don't have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. The Bible emphasizes community and connectedness, and it uses that community and that connectedness as a very, very important part of what he's doing in the world. Uh, you might say it this way, as go our relationships, so goes our service of the kingdom and participating in God's mission. Now, take a deep breath and just pause with me for a minute. What do we know? We know as human beings that we were created for community. We also know that at heart, the gospel itself is relational. We know that the building blocks of Christ's community are actually relational. And we know that God's mission and our relationships are inextricably tied to one another. So what? Well, ideas have consequences. If something is true, there are consequences to that truth that are intended to have a bearing upon how we live and the choices that we make. So I want to offer to you two implications, two important implications that come from all of this. The first one is this. When it's all been said, when it's all been done, when it's all over, all that's left are relationships. This is a word for all of us. I want you to imagine that I'm wrapping up a funeral right now. I did a funeral this week for a spectacular man named Don Wallace. He loved his wife. He loved his girls, Sherry and Brenda. He loved his grandson, Nate. He loved his friends. He loved his neighbors. He loved those that he worked with. He loved lost people. When it was all done, on that day when Don's earthly life came to an end at Foothills Hospital, and he was given, as we say, a new tent, a new body in heaven, all that was left were his relationships. I don't care who you are or what you're doing with your life, or how much or how little money you have. I'm just telling you this. When it's all been said and when it's all been done, all that's left are your relationships. I've been a pastor for 37 years. Jamie and I have had the privilege of serving churches in B.C., Alberta, Saskatchewan, as well as in uh, Pennsylvania and Oregon. And over those years of meeting so many great people and serving wonderful churches, I have met thousands of spiritually-minded, gospel-devoted, strategic, well-meaning people who search with all their heart for the right house and the right schools and the right neighborhood and the right doctor and the right dentist and the right accountant, even the right coaches for their kids. But when it comes to searching for the right people, to fill their lives. They spent so little time and energy on that. Many otherwise thoughtful and energetic people seem to be passive, disinterested, and unmotivated. They displayed no understanding of what's at stake. Your relationship with God and your relationship with other people is all that's left when it's done. That's how high the stakes are on this. That leads naturally to my second implication. My second implication is this. I want to offer a second word to those of you who are hearing my words 
who are locked in conflict right now with someone. It may be with a family member. It might be somebody at work. It might be a friend, a coworker. It could be your spouse or your best friend. But something has happened along the way. There's been some kind of a blow or blowout, or there's just been a steady decline in that relationship, a silencing of a friendship. And lots of those things happened during COVID. They're going on right now. And we all have stories. I have lots of stories I could tell about this. Family members stop talking. A couple of people at work go to battle. Words are exchanged. Tempers flare. That passive, aggressive, ignoring one another ensues. There's this kind of silly sense of a ceasefire that sits silently smoldering away as you pretend that that person no longer matters to you. Whatever. You know the conflicts in your life well. And if this relates to you, if this implication relates to you, right now it's highly likely that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about that. And my word to you today is to put your weapons down. End the war. Bring the ceasefire to a conclusion in a peaceful manner. It's time to end this. It's time to talk about this. It's time to make a call or drop a text or best of all, make a visit or get on, and get on track or make things right. I've done some reading over the years about how revivals happen, how we get back on track with God. And if you feel far from him, you feel like God's silent, feel distant from him, it's actually not going to be that he's gone anywhere. It's going to be that you closed off the portion of your heart that's open to him and walking in obedience. And as one of your signs out in the lobby says, we pray first, then we obey. At Rock Point, we, we de define a disciple as someone who hears God's voice, obeys, and influences others to do the same. And perhaps that process has stopped happening. You haven't been praying and obeying. You haven't been listening, hearing, obeying, and influencing others to do the same. James chapter 4 begins with these words. Where do you think all these appalling wars and quarrels come from? Did you think they just happen? Think again. They come about because you want your own way and you fight for it deep inside yourselves. You lust for what you don't have and you're willing to kill to get it. You want what isn't yours and will risk violence to put your hands on it. Do you just hear those words? Killing and violence. James is writing to the people of God, those words. So two prophetic warnings for you. First, conflict is the battleground of our enemy. That is why when revivals happen, it often happens because people get right with one another. They confess sin and repent of it and make it right we must learn to watch for our enemy, Satan, who more than anything wants to derail our relationship with God, and he does so by derailing our relationships with one another. And among the tactics he works to mire us in is conflict. So often it's conflict. He attacks our identity. He lures us into temptation. And if we know that, we can watch for it. That self-doubt that keeps you up at night is not a midlife crisis. It's the enemy trying to chip away as, at, at your identity as the beloved of God. The temptation to take shortcuts at work isn't a matter of efficiency. It's spiritual attack. And for sure, the conflict in your small group or in your marriage or in that friendship or with that former colleague or with someone in your extended family or with that coworker or with that neighbor is no longer an issue of incompatible personalities, but an issue of the enemy trying to destroy your walk with Christ by influencing your relationships and your unity with others. Don't let him get away with it. Second prophetic warning. Please read my lips when I say this. There is no biblical justification for continued conflict with which we refuse to deal. There is no biblical justification for continued conflict with which we refuse to deal. The Bible tells us over and over and over again that we must deal 
with our conflicts in a biblical, loving way, surrendering to the reign of Christ in our lives. Maybe you need to hear it afresh this morning. Allow these scriptures to be a gift to you. Hebrews 12, 4. Live a work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Ties conflict to holiness and holiness to seeing the Lord. Matthew 5, 9. God blesses those who work for peace, for they shall be called the children of God. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. If you're offering your gift at the altar and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar because there's nothing more important and go and be reconciled to that person and then come and offer your sacrifice to God. And remember, he's speaking to somebody. You suddenly remember that somebody else has something against you. It's not that he says, you've done something to someone else. He says, someone else considers that you've done something wrong to them. Romans 12, 17 to 19. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you're honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. And dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. Matthew 6, 15. If you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. And then finally, Romans 12, 18, to put it again. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. So put your weapons down. To serve in the way you're called to serve as a volunteer at Westlife, you must put your weapons down. You must work hard to restore relationships. Recognize your sin. Rebuke the enemy and tell him to go away. Ask someone to pray with you about this. Start praying with, for the person with whom you are having the conflict and watch how God grows your love for them. Make that call. Write that text. Make that visit. Don't let the sun go down another day on your anger. Ask God again for his help. Watch for the things that draw you away from the kingdom of God, instead pulling you into the kingdom of darkness. Name the tactics of the enemy as you recognize them and tell him in the name of Jesus to go away. Recognize that in your arsenal are illegal weapons poised for use. Be open to outside help. The bottom line, humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's how James puts it at the end of his conflict passage. In closing, I know we're Canadians, but remember, perhaps remember, you may remember when Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial back in 1963. Sometime go and listen to that speech because it's quite amazing. I want you to hear some of his words because they came back to me this week as I prepared He says, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream that one day, right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. Listen to this. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. Martin Luther King is drawing off of God's plan for his people. He is going back to the prophet Isaiah, where Isaiah prophesies using all these special words of what God is going to do one day in birthing a new community filled with wonder and beauty and acceptance and love and a lack of uh, conflict and a, a presence of peace. And that new community is this new community in Acts chapter 2. And that is our vision of what we can be. This community that Ephesians 2 describes as having been created by Christ's work on the cross, this is a community that's worth being part of. It's worth being all in. And being all in means that we deal with our relational goop. And I want to remind you of the freedom that comes when we experience restoration in a relationship with someone else. 
You see, this community is where God wants to do his best stuff. This community is the place where God pours out his grace and it's never in short supply. This is the community where the wonder of love and acceptance and forgiveness are constantly put on display day after day as we do, as Paul calls us to, to bear with one another and love one another. So you, wherever you're listening from today, are a servant of the church. You've got some way in which you are generous with your time. You volunteer your time in the way God calls you to. Perhaps you're using your gifts. You feel like you're right in a role that God's called you to. And I want to remind you that a prerequisite for serving in that way is a heart that is clean in relationship to other people. So I want to just stop, and I want to pray for you all. It's a wonder to be at another church, praying for this church. We're all part of the church. So Lord, I pray for my friends at Westlife. I pray that they would hear and see the truth today with a humble, joyful acceptance of what you say about relationships. I pray that you would help all of us to see and to live into the idea that there is a deep connection between your mission in the world and the way we live in our relationships. And if our relationships are not walked through in purity, if we're not walking with integrity, if we're not doing all we can to live at peace with others, it deeply influences the ways in which you can use us as a part of your mission in the world. And I pray for old and young, whoever happens to be listening to this message today, that you would grant every one of us the grace to walk humbly, to hear your voice, and to respond as you call us to Holy Spirit, we invite you to speak to us about these different areas of our lives. And I pray you would empower anyone today that just has this sense that you're calling them to do something about it. Give them the courage, fill them with the courage to go and make amends and to take a broken world and make it somewhat less broken. And we pray these things in your name. Amen.